we've been working our way through Romans, and I hope you've been reading through Romans as we've worked along, as we've gone along. Uh, we come today to chapter 13, and the, just taking on the first seven verses of chapter 13 and dealing with a subject that's um, it's, it's divided a few congregations and a, a few groups. It is a, it's a difficult chapter, but I'm gonna, I want us to tackle it today. Before we go into that, though, I want to go to the Lord uh, in prayer. Dear Father God, as we come to your word today, as we take hold of your word, we pray that you would take hold of our hearts. For you are the master potter, Lord. We pray that you would shape our hearts in keeping with your word and in the image of your Son, so that we would not leave this place as we came, but we would be changed by the power of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's read. The title of the sermon today is Towing the Line and Drawing the Line, and we'll see what we mean by that. Romans 13, beginning at verse 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this you, pay, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Remember, many of you will, remember back in the day, when if you did something at school, and for those of you who can't remember because you're too young, I will tell you there was a day in this country, in, this time, in, this, in our country, where if, when if you did something wrong in school that caused you to get a paddling, two things were likely to happen. Number one, your parents were going to find out about it, and then when dad got home, you were going to get a second paddling or worse. And for you young folks, if you don't believe that's true, ask your elders. <laughs> but boy, how things have changed. Today, if a child gets a paddling in school, if such a thing even happens anymore, when they get home, mom and dad are more likely to, to take them out for frozen yogurt or ice cream just to help them get over the trauma. And then after the celebration's over, mom and dad are more likely, much more likely to sue the, the school board and the teacher than they are to, to discipline the child. I'm exaggerating, of course, but not by much, and I, and I do so to make a point. What has changed? Back in the day, parents in this country considered teachers to be their agents. Even more than that, teachers, even in public schools, a teacher in a public school was considered to use the legal expression in loco parentis, which is a Latin phrase that means in the place of the parent. That was how teachers were viewed, not only by parents, but also the students themselves. A teacher had virtually the same authority over a child in areas of discipline and instruction as the parents did. But boy, how things have changed today in, in today's culture and today's society. Those days are gone. Today, public schools and teachers are increasingly viewed with distrust, both by the parents and by the students, and the feeling is mutual. Teachers know that if they discipline a student, or even give them a failing grade in some cases, they're subject to challenge by the student's parents and even by their own administration. It's no longer in loco parentis, it's just plain loco. <laughs> <coughs> now you're probably wondering, why, is, why am I talking about teachers in school systems, in school boards, when in today's text, Paul is clearly talking about governing authorities. Well, I refer to the, school, to the school board classroom example by way of analogy. Paul is saying here in chapter 13 of Romans that a Christian's attitude toward government, any government, 
should be the same as our attitude used to be in this country towards school boards and the teachers that they put in place. To continue the school analogy, when a government, when it comes to government, Paul is saying, Christians should keep in mind that God hired the superintendent of schools and put the teachers in the classroom. If the government gives us a spanking or paddling, so to speak, Paul says we deserved it. If we had followed the rules, it wouldn't have happened. But we should be careful not to take this analogy too far, especially in areas of discipline. Because Paul is not saying that we should equate punishment meted out by government agents with God's wrath on the day of judgment. He's not saying that. He's saying the discipline is used for something else. But what Paul is saying is this. If publicly or privately we declare the government we have be, to be illegitimate, if we say the government we have has no place, no right to govern, and deserves no respect, if that's where you are in your attitude toward our government now, or, or has it ever been your attitude toward government, you need to go back and reread chapter 13 of Romans, verses 1 through 7. Because Paul says there that the government we have in place now has been instituted by God. Just like the government before that, and the government before that, and before that, and before that, on ad infinitum into the past. Sometimes God votes Democrat, and sometimes he votes Republican. <laughs> sometimes he gives us the Congress controlled by one party, and sometimes by another. And sometimes he splits his ticket. And as for president, sometimes he gives us a Lincoln, and sometimes we have to settle for a Ford. And at other times he gives us a president who appears to, have to know more about peanuts than he does about policy. <laughs> I mean, so it goes. But here's what we should always keep in mind. No matter who occupies the Oval Office, no matter which party controls Congress, no matter who sits in Nashville or who controls City Hall, God is always king. Amen. And he is sovereign over all things. We do not worship a God who has one hand tied behind his back or who is blind in one eye or who needs to ask anyone to find out what's happening in America or who has to ask for anyone's help or permission in order to change the history and the course of history. And here's another thing. The new heaven and the new earth that all Christians look forward to and anticipate, the new heaven and the new earth will not come by way of legislative initiative or presidential order. The second coming will not come to us by way of Washington. Here's the thing, though. Our attitude toward government, a government that God has put in place, speaks volumes for how we understand God's role in other areas of life. We must never compartmentalize God's role in our life or his role in this world. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, we must never say to ourselves, well, God may be sovereign over my home life, but not over my work life. He may be Lord over my tithes, but not over my taxes. He may have had something to do with picking my pastor, but he sure didn't have anything to do with picking the president or the governor or the mayor. No, implicit in every verse we were considering today are these two truths. God has no limits, and we must never live our lives as if he does. Now, I suspect some of you, maybe many of you, are thinking, how can it be that I should give any respect to a government that promotes so many policies that give that evidence an utter lack of respect for God's revealed word. Well, to start with, Paul does not say that because the government has been instituted by God that we should expect that government to institute policies that honor God. In fact, we know from history that the opposite is typically true. The pages of history are filled with examples of governments that have not honored God. They're full of them. So Paul is not saying that we should submit to the government's rule because the government is godly. He is saying that we should submit to the government's rule because God has put that government in place. 
It is therefore our Christian duty to submit to such government. We must, if you will, toe the line. But think of it this way. In last week's message, Larry reminded us that in everything we do, we do what? We worship God. If we wash dishes, we worship God. We go to the office and work, we worship God. Or the factory, or wherever we go to work, we worship God. So then it must also be true that if we participate in the electoral process to choose our government, we are also worshiping God. And it further follows that when we submit to the government that that electoral process provides us, and maybe especially so when it provides us with a government that we find offensive, we also worship God. You see, we must always remember that while we must submit to the government, in doing so we serve the king. Now if you're still finding all this hard to swallow, let's turn our attention to Jesus for a moment. Never, consider, never hurts to consider what Jesus did, did it, does it? And let's see how he responded to the government of his day. Now, Jesus was born into an Israel occupied by a foreign power, a foreign government, the Roman Empire. This was a government that allowed the Jews a certain amount of religious autonomy, but gave them no real ability to govern themselves. It represented a society that by its very nature mocked the Jewish faith. To the Roman mind, if uh, gods were currency, the Jews were all but bankrupt because they only had one. And it levied very heavy taxes on the Jews, and it did so in a very creative way. It licensed the Jews to tax themselves so that they, whatever the Jewish tax collector could collect, it, as long as he satisfied the, the, the Roman requirement, he could, collect, he could keep anything he, he collected over that for himself. Think of it as taxation by way of extortion. It was also a government, though, that it employed, it didn't create, but it employed one of, the most, one of the cruelest forms of capital punishment ever devised, the crucifixion. So in other words, the Roman government, the Roman power under, under which Jesus was born, under which he lived, for the Jews gave them much to hate and nothing to love. So faced with a government that was godless in every way, what did Jesus do? Did he spend his time building a rebel army to oppose that government and building a civilian network to support it? Did he speak openly and angrily about how the Romans had no right to rule and call on the people to revolt? Of course, we all know Jesus did none of those things. Jesus lived under Roman rule even as he made it his life's mission to do what? To do the will of his father. That was a close second. <laughs> Jesus made it clear that his earthly ministry, that in his earthly ministry, he did not come to bring about social reform or political revolution. He did not, over, he did not come to overthrow the Roman authorities by violent means. Nor did he come to his, to, so that his people might have an easier life. No, none of that. Instead, Jesus came not so that whoever believed on him would have not an easier life, but eternal life. Now remember the scene of Jesus before the Roman governor Pilate, just shortly before Jesus would be taken by the Roman soldiers and crucified? Jesus said very little to Pilate, but what he did say spoke volumes on this issue of submission. When Pilate has raised the issue of Jesus' kingship to him, Jesus responds in chapter 18 of the Gospel of John with these words. Jesus says, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world or from the world. A short time later, same, same time period, just, just minutes later really, Jesus and Pilate had this exchange in chapter 19 of the Gospel of John. Pilate said, do you not know that I have authority to release you or authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. Jesus submitted to the arrest by the Jews 
and he submitted to the sentence of death that the Roman soldiers carried out. The Roman soldiers who were soldiers to one of the most godless governments that ever existed. And as every Christian knows, in submitting to all of that, Jesus honored his father, our father. So are we to submit to everything the government dishes out, no matter what it is? No, Jesus didn't teach that, and Paul is not saying that here in Romans 13. What did Jesus say when the Jews tried to draw him out on the issue of taxation? You know, what, should we pay the Roman? Is it lawful to pay the Roman taxes? Jesus said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. In other words, in living our lives, we must know when to toe the line, and when to draw the line. We must know the difference between compromise, between compromise and cooperation, or between cooperation and compromise. Now, I started to talking today about school. Now I want to talk about Sunday school, because I want to talk about some folks that y'all will all remember from Sunday school, some, our, some of our friends from the book of Daniel. On this issue of the difference between and knowing the difference between cooperation with the government and compromising our faith in God. I want to turn to, to the book of Daniel and our friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which were their Babylonian names, and Daniel himself. Daniel and his three friends had been brought to Babylon by the armies of King Nebuchadnezzar, the same king whose armies a few years later would ransack Jerusalem and destroy the temple of Solomon. They were just boys at that point, mere teenagers. But Nebuchadnezzar pressed them into his service, into his administration, if you will, after first making, requiring them to submit to three years of education and training in the literature and language of the Chaldeans or the Babylonians. And through a special set of circumstances that you can read about in chapter 2 of the book of Daniel, they were all elevated to positions of authority in, 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 within Nebuchadnezzar's administration. So the same king who ransacked Jerusalem and destroyed the temple, they served him loyally for years and years. They towed the line until the point came when they had to draw the line. Nebuchadnezzar built a, a gold statue about 60 cubits, which was about 90 feet tall, and he required everyone in his administration at an appointed time to bow down and worship this image. Nebuchadnezzar, I mean, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to do that. Of course, they were reported to Nebuchadnezzar. Another comparison to school, your so-called friends will always rat you out. <laughs> and so the king got word of it. He brought them before him, and we pick up the story at Daniel chapter 3, beginning at verse 13. The Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered. You just hear him answering with one voice and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, we will not serve the, your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Many years later, decades later, in fact, Daniel, who had somehow missed the golden statue fiery furnace episode, faced his own challenge. By this time, Nebuchadnezzar had died, and his kingdom had passed under the, to the control of the Medo-Persians. 
And Daniel, during this many, many decades, has served loyally all the administrations that have come, one after all the reigns and kingdoms that have come, one after the other. That is until uh, uh, Darius, uh, he was serving under Darius at this time, and the, there was a group of people there because Daniel was about to be made head of, he was about to be made second only to the king, and Daniel had a lot of enemies. So they went to the king and convinced him to make a decree that for 30 days, no one was able to worship any god or man other than the king under penalty of being thrown into the lion's den. And you think Congress passes some hard laws. <laughs> we pick up at chapter 6, we're going to see Daniel's response to that. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. I think it's very important. Daniel knew about the decree, but he didn't say, well, that King Jairus isn't going to tell me what I can do. He went and did what he did every day. He prayed to God. Now, of course, the jealous officials who had caused the king to set up this decree, they spy on Daniel. I'm not sure how they did that because he had his rooms, he prayed in the upper rooms. But anyway, they, they, they went and uh, spied on him, and they reported back to the king. And so we pick up at verse 16 what happened next. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Now the Bible goes on to say that the king didn't eat that night, and by the grace of God, neither did the lions. But here's the thing we shouldn't miss. Everyone, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, were saved by the grace of God. But... We should not understand these men as having done what they did because they just assumed God would save them. That's not why they did what they did. They did what they did because they knew there are worse things than dying. They knew that denying their God was worse than any death they had to suffer or may have to suffer. Notice also that in drawing the line, as they did, as these four men did, and refusing to obey, the, to obey the king's order, they still submitted to the government's authority. They didn't try to run away. They didn't fight. They didn't hide. They didn't do any of those things. They accepted the punishment that their refusal to obey brought upon them and depended upon God to either... To save, either, to save their souls, certainly, and if it was in his good pleasure to, serve their bodies, to save their bodies as well. But they did not presume on God's grace in that regard. So what do Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel later teach us about where to draw the line, when to draw the line? Well, in each of these situations, they drew the line and refused to obey the government when to do so, when, that, when, to, when, when obeying the government would require them, would have required them to go against the revealed word of God. And they knew the reveal, re, revealed word of God. They knew their commandments. They knew that they were, they were instructed by God, you shall have no other gods before me. And you shall not make or worship any idols. And they knew that God had the power to save them even as they accepted the possibility that he may, not, he may choose not to do so. In other words, they knew their Bibles, and they knew and trusted the God who had given them that word. And in, and in Daniel's case, they also knew the importance of prayer. All those indications earlier in the book of Daniel that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were also very well acquainted with the power of prayer. So, how are we to apply this to our own lives? How are we to know when to and where to draw the line? We've got to read the Word. We've got to study the Word. We've got to know the Word. And we have to go to the Lord regularly in prayer. There is no substitute for reading the book, knowing the book, 
living the book. That's the only way, you, in going to the Lord in prayer, that's the only way we're going to know when and where to draw the line. Now, wait a minute. Some of you, have to, some of you have to be saying, now, wait a minute. This is America. This is America. This is America. I live in America. There can be no way. This can't be about me. Knowing when to draw the line? Well, I pray that that day never comes when we'll be required to draw the line. But the truth is this, that we live in a world. We live in a world where the gospel exists, and, a, and the truth of the gospel exists in a world that is increasingly hostile to it. So the day may come. So what should we do today, tomorrow, and the day after that? We should read the word, know the word, live the word, and pray without ceasing. So we must toe the line until and, and, and be in preparation for the day when we may be called upon to draw it. Let us pray. Dear Father, we give you thanks for your word because without it we would be at sea. We would be drifting and lost. We would not know where to go. But Lord, you, you, are, you have given us your word and you've given us your spirit to live within us so that we are not left orphans. We are not left alone. We are not left without guidance. And we give you thanks for all of that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.